On this episode of Common Mystics, we relate the story of Samuel Colt, a controversial figure who altered the course of his family station, of weaponry itself, and of the history of the United States. I'm Jennifer James. I'm Jill Stanley. We're psychics. We're sisters. We are common mystics. We find extraordinary stories in ordinary places. And today, we have the story of Samuel Colt. That's right, Jennifer. Mm. We were on probably my favorite road trip of all time. I know. It was so fun. It was a great one. We were leaving Pennsylvania, headed towards Hartford, Connecticut, because we were on a mission to find Catherine Hepburn's grave. Yes, we were. So as we were driving east, we set the intention in the car. Can you please describe what our intentions were? Absolutely. Our intention was, as it always is, to find a verifiable story previously unknown to us that allows us to give voice to the voiceless. That's right. And so as we were driving through Connecticut, headed to Hartford. To find Kate. To find Kate. That's our girl. What were we picking up on in the car? Okay, we saw signs for Newtown, Connecticut. And that brought to mind the terrible school shooting that happened there in 2012. Yeah, terrible. Terrible. In in case you folks are not familiar with the incident, this is a trigger warning because it is horrific. There was a school shooting and eight-year-old babies were killed. And so we were talking about that incident and we were sending prayers for the families affected and for the children lost. So that was uplifting. Uh, (laughs) Also, we were picking up on the amount of cemeteries that were surrounding us. Literally, Mm. I said to you, it's like we're surrounded by death. Mm. True. What were you feeling? I was picking up on war memorials. Mm, You sure were. Mm -hmm. And that idea of people dying in war. Mm -hmm. Also, we were talking about how Connecticut's bougie. Mm -hmm. And like, it's like beautiful. It felt like Connecticut was judging us. Yeah, like we don't belong in Connecticut. Right. Like Connecticut was like, (laughs) "Um, please leave trash. And I was like, sorry, Connecticut. Uh Uh-huh. So... We ended up going straight into Cedar Hill Cemetery, where Kate was buried. Now, we're going to detour what happened when we were at that cemetery. I don't know if it's going to be on this detours or the next one, but you guys will hear about it. But after we hobnobbed with the Hepburns, we were walking around the cemetery. What hits were you getting as we were walking around? I was feeling that somebody had died at sea or was lost at sea, but definitely a death at sea. Yes, you did. That Mm -hmm. was like, you just pulled that out. I know. I was drawn across the gravesides to this very large gravestone, for lack of a better word. It's a monument. Monument, yeah. Yeah, it's a monument for real. And it was dedicated or it had the name of Elizabeth Hart Jarvis on the side of it. Now, it felt it felt like a mother energy. Mm-hmm. If I felt sadness and I felt like a familiar connection to this woman, like spoiler alert, we have almost identical names. Mhm. Cuz my name is Jill Elizabeth and my maiden name was Jarvis. So, oh, seeing wow. a, well it was, but oh, to we're see, public now. <laughs> Well, the public wants to know. So to see that it was, I was taken and it felt very personal. It felt very, it was felt like it involved a family. Mm -hmm. We were driving through Hartford and we were struck by the churches. The churches in Hartford seem to have significance. And again, a World War II memorial, a memorial to soldiers who had died at war was significant. And what about you? You know, I was feeling like cowboys. Like Mm. I was feeling boom, boom. Like the, those kind of old timey guns with the smoke. That's how I was feeling. <laughs> okay. Okay. And this is funny. I want to just say this. This was funny because we traveled far outside of the, the area that w- that was ideal for our Spideys. And Jennifer was like, wah, wah, where are we? And she was like, just keep going. Just keep going. So this was kind of funny because we were disappointed. But Jennifer was like, it felt like it felt like tenacity. Like there was that feeling of tenacity. Like I know it's not good now, but <laughs> you know, just push through, push through. It's gonna get better. 
just you hang know, in there. The feeling. <laughs> so what did I write with? What did I write in the notes? I don't even remember. You wrote disappointment. Keep going. <laughs> it was funny. Um, oh gosh. So. As always, we have absolutely no clue what we're picking up on until we do nope. the research, right? Right. We so, don't know what it means. Mm-hmm. We don't know what it means. Mm-mm. Just because you're psychic doesn't mean you can translate translate messages from spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, we need to we need to do the research for sure. That's right. And what did we find, Jennifer? Tell me. Well, we found a connection to a very controversial American figure by the name of Samuel Colt. I did not know, like, I'm not a gun person. I don't know anything about guns, really. So this was really surprising to me that mm-hmm. that this that this man's story kind of was like on our pages. Mm. Tell me a little bit about him. Well, he was born in 1814 and came to be known as, quote, an American genius. Mm. And he has been credited as inventing the revolver or a type of revolver. But let's start with his early life, shall we? I would love to. Tell me everything. Tell me about young Samuel. Yes, little Sammy, little Samuel Colt, was born, like I said, July 19th, 1814, in Hartford, Connecticut. And he was born the son of Christopher Colt and his wife, Sarah Caldwell, who were of modest means. So his parents, Christopher and Sarah, were poor. It was a pretty dire situation, so much that... Christopher's businesses kept failing. So it was a miracle that Sarah even got to marry Christopher because Sarah's father was not into the marriage at all. Can you tell us a little bit why? Christopher, Samuel's father, experienced so many business failures throughout his life. He made constant like attempt after attempt to establish a, a stable source of income, but his endeavors were often failures and they were met with disappointment and he was just not able to provide. His ventures ranged from farming to working with textiles and he was determined as hell, but he was not able to be successful. And this financial instability became a constant companion to to poor Christopher. And adversely, it affected his re- his reputation and his standing in the community. And that's why Sarah Caldwell's father did not want her to marry him. Yeah, because mm-hmm. Sarah came from a pretty substantial family. Like, they had means. They were well-connected. They sure were. Sarah's father was Major John Caldwell, who was a prominent merchant in the area. Mm-hmm. Sarah fell in love with Christopher, though, and she was not concerned with his financial situation at all, and she begged for her father's blessing. Eventually, her father, Major Caldwell, relented and signed off on his daughter's marriage to Christopher. And eventually, the Colt family... Sarah and Christopher moved to Ware, Massachusetts, where Christopher owned a silk mill. Right. You know, that's got to be really embarrassing that the woman you love's father was like, he's a loser. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that's got to be, that kind of hurts. And knowing that, like, knowing that as a child, like, you know, mom's family didn't want her to marry dad, like, that would be kind of like a a burden to bear. You know what I mean? That kind of would make you feel shitty about yourself. Like, I can't. I kind of come from trash on my parental line. Yeah. That, but I love what it says about Sarah because she didn't care. Sarah <laughs> she didn't, didn't care. care. She didn't Mm-mm. care. She loved him. She wanted to marry him. She wanted to have babies. And they did. They had babies. They did have. They had six <laughs> they, babies. They they sure did. But there was tragedy to strike. Sarah's life would be cut terribly short. She would succumb to tuberculosis Samuel was his fifth child, and he was only seven years old at the time of his mother's death. But Samuel had five other brothers and sisters, of course. He had two older sisters, Margaret, who was 15, and Sarah Ann, who was 13, and two older brothers, John Caldwell, who was 11, and Christopher Jr., who was nine. Of course, there was Samuel, who was seven, and his younger brother, James, who was five at the time of their mother's passing. Very sad. 
It is very sad. And, you know, if I were Christopher, I would be looking for someone to help me with these six children. You got it. And that's what he did. And he saw comfort and companionship in the company of Olive Sargent, whom he (laughs) married. Well, good. I mean, it's not their mother, but at least they have some like female mothering figure to come in and help raise them, you know? Such a young age to lose your mom, it, you know? All of the children were very young, from 5 to 15. But unfortunately, Olive turned out to be like the quintessential evil stepmother. Shut up. I am serious. So whereas Sarah, their mom, had been loving and nurturing, Olive was stern and uncompromising. She was really harsh with the children, And she was known for her austere demeanor and high expectations that the children could never meet. It's like, who are you to even put that on Mm. these kids? Mom would never stand for that. Well, she, she was the woman of the house. And she also governed that household with an iron fist. And I don't like it. I know. It was a really sad time in the lives of the cult children. Let's just put it that way. Mm. But not only that, Olive was totally domineering over her husband, Christopher, and she saw to it that the children were removed from the household altogether. What? Uh Uh-huh. She enrolled the girls. I know. She enrolled the girls in a boarding school. Miss Huntley Finishing School was the name of it. And the boys were shipped off to their male relatives to learn the trades. Now, that sounds pretty. Pretty shitty, but I think you and I could have benefited from a Miss Huntley's finishing school. Don't you think we're like a little rough around the edges? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I would be standing up or sitting down with my back straight. Like I have the worst posture. The books on her. I feel like I should be putting books on my head right now. I feel like I am a gorilla, like a full size (laughs) male gorilla, like the way I'm hunched in a sea all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And Mm. I mean, so Mm -mm. many things, so many things. So hopefully the girls got something good out of their experience there. But that really sucks that they were shipped off away from home at such young ages. And think about it. You are not only shipped off away from home. Your mom died. Feels like your dad doesn't want you anymore. Mm -hmm. And this evil woman is in between. It's like the liaison between you and your father. Yeah. Like that sucks. Right. Now, in 1825, when he was 11 years old... Samuel was in Glastonbury, where he worked as an endangered farmhand, and he was also schooled there. And during that time, another family tragedy struck. Margaret, his older sister, committed suicide by poisoning herself with arsenic. She was only 19. So Margaret was dating this hot ass guy and she was really, really, really into him. And then like they were out on the town one day walking around with like a parasol. And then she noticed him like look at another girl. So she was like, oh my gosh, like you have me. Why are you looking at other people? You know what? Forget you, hot guy. I don't need you. So Mm -hmm. the hot guy and her broke up. And then that guy started dating another girl around town. And within a short period of time, they got engaged and they sent Margaret an invitation for the wedding. So the day of the wedding, Christopher and Olive gave Margaret like a large amount of money to get a beautiful dress to be a stunner, to really like be like, I didn't need you. Congratulations on your life. Be happy. His eyes wander. But instead, she got all dressed up. She drank the arsenic without telling anybody. And she just said her heart was broken. It's one thing not to live without him, but it's another thing to have him marry someone else. And that's why she killed herself. Oh, my God. I know. Crazy, right? Way to bring me down, Jill. Dark. Way to bring me down. It's dark. This this is dark. Oh, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Poor Margaret. Poor Margaret. (sighs) Never let a man do that to you. (laughs) Put your head up high. You don't need a man. Okay. Okay. Shall we move on? That's really sad. Poor Margaret. Okay. Then in 1829, at the age of 15, Samuel began working at his father's silk mill in Mare, Massachusetts. And it was here that he started to gain an interest in all things mechanical. Okay. He often dismantled objects, including his father's firearms, to see how they worked. There was that no. Would, that would be annoying. There's Where's nothing to do. 
<laughs> they took my gun and put it over there. The trigger was over here. No, but there's nothing to do in the 1800s. So that's what the, the kids were doing. They were like, oh, I can take Pop's axe and take the handle off. And, yeah. you know, it's just weird, boring stuff. Thank well, God for iPhones. He, he, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. And the other thing he liked to do is build things. So he liked to take things apart and they liked to build things. So he drew inspiration from an encyclopedia and he constructed a DIY galvanic cell, which is an invention from the late 1700s that would become like the precursor to the modern batteries, you know, like Duracell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he promoted his homemade apparatus as a spectacular 4th of July spectacle. And he planned to use it to detonate an underwater explosive and obliterate a raft on Ware Pond. Well, he detonated the explosive. The raft was missed, but he he did cause a sensation because the the explosion was truly awe inspiring to the people that Fourth of July. So his, so. his so Christopher was there, and so was Olive, and it was impressive to see the explosion and the water like being spit sure. up into the sky. But Olive was like, "You missed the raft, Samuel. Is that right? You missed the raft. Yep. He was fifteen years old." I know. Like, and somebody should have taken that away from him. Like, I don't think 15-year-olds should be playing with explosives. That's just me, though, apparently. Also, we need to address encyclopedias for our younger audiences, Jennifer. <laughs> Can you please describe what an encyclopedia was? Imagine that someone printed out all of Wikipedia and put it in alphabetical order. Very nice. You're welcome. In volumes of books. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Please continue. So now... At the age of 16, Samuel Colt joined Amherst Academy in Massachusetts, and he wanted to study navigation or seafaring, right? He wanted to be a sailor. Mm -hmm. However, his mischievous behavior and his love of explosives was just too much for the academy, and um, he was expelled from the school. Because he did it again. He built the explosive and he put, and he like detonated it at the school. And the school was like, yeah, we can't have like a bomb maker just blowing shit up here. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work for us. So you're just going to have to go. I, I agree with them. Good job. Mm. Good mm -hmm. job, Amherst Academy. So Samuel, no longer a student, had the chance to gain firsthand experience in navigation with his father, who arranged for him to embark on a year-long voyage aboard the Corvo in 1830. And this is where the legend of Samuel Colt began. Mm -hmm. He transferred the mechanical workings that he witnessed on the boat to a brand new application. Would you like to hear about it? I'm so bored with this. <laughs> this is really just, cool, I think. I do. I think were, this okay. is really cool. Because this is the legend of the man and like how he came up with this brilliant idea. The funny want, part about this is it's so James Beckworth because this legend of the man was created by the man. So just saying, please tell me. I'm just bored with the whole gun thing because it's like... Just think about being on the ship and you're just like sailing across the Atlantic and all you're doing is watching the wheel of the boat And you're thinking about guns around. and how guns right. work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So aboard the Corvo, and this, by the way, comes from history.com. Aboard the Corvo, Colt became fascinated with the ship's wheel, particularly the way it could alternately spin or be locked in a fixed position through the use of a clutch. And he translated this controlled rotation to firearms and a means whereby a single shot pistol could be adapted to fire multiple rounds in quick succession. You can just see it in your head, can't you? You've seen it like Dirty yeah. Harry. Yeah. yeah. Are you mm -hmm. feeling lucky? <laughs> and during his time at sea, Colt carved a six-barrel cylinder locking pin and hammer out of wood. Oh, that's a little obsessive, mm -hmm. but whatever. Well, so according to the author of Devil's Right Hand that you're going to reference later on, with his research, there was an author that was really suspicious. I forgot the guy's name. Read the book. It's a really good book. But the author was really suspicious of the timing because the Corvo had stopped off in London and was docked at the River Thames right by the Tower of London. And inside the Tower of London, there was 
old ammunition and old technologies relating to that of modern day revolvers. So the fact that he was on the ship and was looking at the wheel and came up with the story was really suspicious because inside the tower, there was something similar that Samuel had said that he invented before he got to London. So that was the whole suspicion. Interesting. Mm-hmm. 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 When Samuel returned from his voyage, he traveled around the country under the name of Dr. Colt. He called himself a doctor. And he hosted a show on the side of the road where he sold laughing gas, nitrous oxide, to people and then entertained the stoned audience. Honestly, Jennifer, th- <laughs> I would go there. That would be that would be like I mean, oh it my does God, sound doc- like fun. So much fun. Dr. Colt's in town. Let's get our <laughs> sniff on and go watch him do some shit. Like that is fun. Wow. Wow. But here you see, here you see that it's during these times, these travels, where his character kind of comes into focus because he's becoming a man who's driven to make money by any means necessary, even if it's to the detriment of others. Like it can't be good for you to suck on nitrous oxide, is it? it like, is that good for you? I mean, I it's not. I wouldn't like <laughs> recommend it, but We're I not mean, recommending that. Are I we going- mean, that, I mean, that hard line, hard yeah, line. Like, no, no. have you okay. seen Little Shop of Horrors and Steve Martin lose himself? Yes. See? Oh, that's nitrous oxide? Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, that does look fun. It does look fun, but I honestly, anyway. kind of genius, but he was really a drug dealer. Okay, so that, that book, yeah, pretty much. So that book that you were referencing was by best-selling author M. William Phillips, And his book is called The Devil's Right Hand, The Tragic Story of the Colt Family Curse. And he discusses that young Samuel didn't invent or even redesign the revolver at all. And it was actually, he goes on to explain on page 176. Yep, yep. That Sam had a long history of taking the experiments and inventions of other people and developing them into a patentable creation from which he could make money. And according to the article of the Association of Ohio Long Rifle Collectors, the revolving pistol which Sam had patented in several countries wasn't invented by 16-year-old Sam aboard a ship at all. But by a gunsmith, Peter Humberger, who had taught the trade he learned from his father to his sons, Peter II, Adam, and Henry. The Humberger family felt that he stole the idea from them. Mm. Interesting. Very there, interesting. There are documented claims to that effect dating as early as 1832. Now, it, it's kind of shocking. I knew that the the story of, I mean, when you read this book, I really do recommend the book. It's not drab at all, even though the you would assume that a book about Samuel Colt, the gunmaker, would be, but it's really good. And y- you can see, like, suspicion about, like, his inventions, but, like, outright, he has a history of stealing other people's ideas and right. then marketing them as his own. mm And so it's not just this one incidence, but this one is really relevant to our story. But yeah, that's some shit. Right around that time, though, right around 1832, there was another devastating loss in the Colt family. And this was Samuel's other sister, Sarah Ann, died to tuberculosis at the tender age of 27. Mm, That's sad. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, but the good news for Samuel was that he actually made quite a bit of money as Dr. Colt, selling nitrous oxide on the side of the road. As you would. Mm Mm-hmm. And so he used these funds to arrange for skilled gunsmiths from Baltimore, Maryland, to construct firearms. He applied for a U.S. patent in 1836, despite... The Humberger families claim to have invented it years earlier. By the way, I'm sorry to interrupt you. By the way, to this day, there is descendants of the Humbergers, Peter Humberger, that have like a whole website like, Samuel Colt stole our shit. 
<laughs> Not even kidding. Go on. I don't blame him. I don't blame him at all. So Samuel's patent, dated August 29th, 1836, safeguarded the fundamental principles of his innovated Colt Patterson firearm. And it featured a revolving breech loading mechanism and a folding trigger marking significant advancements in firearm technology. And his patent outlines several notable improvements, such as an enhanced loading efficiency, adjustments to the cylinder's weight and placement for improved stability, and a remarkable increase in the rate of discharges. So basically, it was faster to load and shoot and more reliable than firearms that used older technology. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. In 1836, Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company commenced production of the Patterson pistol at their factory in Patterson, New Jersey. With yeah. financial support from his rich cousin, Dudley. That's right. So his rich cousin, Dudley, was like, yeah, I'll help you out. I believe in this mission. I'll give you money. But Samuel was going out. He was thinking big. He was mm. like courting other people with money to invest and politicians because mm. he was like, I need to sell these guns that I'm making. Mm -hmm. Who can I sell it to? So he was trying over and over again to sell it to the U.S. military. Mm-hmm. Now, they were making a lot of weapons. They produced over 1,000 weapons by the end of that year, 1837, but they failed to make any sales at all. Mm -mm -mm. Even though Samuel tried and tried again to sell his guns to the U.S. Secretary of War, but they were thought to be just too innovative and potentially unreliable due to a percussion cap in the, in the Colt firearms. So let me kind of explain this for a minute. It's really Please. kind of interesting that they thought that this cap might be unreliable and they were afraid of this new technology because the other guns before this technology of the cap were using a trigger, right? So you pull the trigger back and when you release the trigger, the trigger hits a piece of flint stone that hits a piece of steel that creates a spark in ideal conditions. And mm -hmm. then that spark floats into this little tray of gunpowder. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was the technology they thought was, was more reliable. And they were afraid of this self-contained little cap that created the ignition, right? Okay. So s during that time, the United States were fighting the Seminoles in the South around Georgia and Florida. Modern day Florida. Mm -hmm. Right. And so Samuel sends guns down to them to be like, here, use my new advanced technology guns to beat off the Seminoles. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a backfire and one of the 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 men of the unit dies. And uh -oh. so when, yeah. And so when the the major of the unit like was like, yeah, Sam, here's your guns back. They killed someone. Sam was like, oh my God, someone is trying to sabotage me and Are gave you, you faulty guns. And that's why, that's why it backfired. Not because this is unpredictable technology. It's because someone is trying to, to ruin me. Wow. So Swear. you're saying the gun literally backfired and yeah, literally killed, killed somebody. Got yeah, it. Yeah, killed a kid. Yep. Wow. Well, for whatever reason, by 1842, the company completely ceased operations. It was not successful. They auctioned off all the firearms, all the gun parts, and all the fixtures to the highest bidders. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, with his failing company, Colt shifted focus to perfecting an underwater mine for harbor defense. Here we go with the underwater explosives again. Yep. What it's is like he, with this guy? He just will not go away. And it's he just always, has to blow shit up. It's true. And like, but it's not only that he's blowing shit up, he's inviting politicians and like all of Washington, D.C. to watch him blow shit up. You know, so they're right. like, Sam, can you just stop? Like, John Quincy Adams was so annoyed with this man. Like, it was his <laughs> nemesis. He was like, oh, my God, tell him not to come here anymore. Hang in there, guys. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. We are so excited to unveil the first book in our series entitled Common Mystics Present Ghost on the Road, Volume 1, Murders and Mysterious Deaths. It's everything you love about Common Mystics and more. It's a retelling of 10 of our favorite stories from our pod with exciting extras. Extras like souvenirs, what we took away from the experience, and what to know if you go if you decide to travel in our footsteps. 
pre-order the Kindle edition now. All other formats of the book will be available for purchase at Amazon.com on July 1st, 2023. Thanks, guys. Now back to the show. Okay, but then more tragedy hits the family, Jill. What happens? Okay, so Samuel is under a lot of pressure in like the early 1840s because... Not only did his company suffer setbacks, leading to a significant loss of his wealth, but he also faced the ordeal of his older brother, John Caldwell. His brother, John, was arrested and tried for the murder of a printer named Samuel Adams in New York City. Not the Samuel Adams, right? Not not the beer guy, no. Not him. He's safe. (laughs) He's safe. Okay, good. Thank God. He's an American treasure. (laughs) Despite Samuel's earnest efforts to leverage government and political connections to intervene in the criminal proceedings, John Caldwell was convicted. He received a death sentence by hanging, but on the morning of his execution, he took his own life by stabbing himself in the heart in his yeah, jail cell. Yeah. Eek. Yeah, it was a tough couple years for old Sam, but the thing is, is that he was trying to finance his brother's defense and like intervene Mm -hmm. as much as possible, not because he loved his brother, but because it made him look bad. Mm, You think so? Absolutely. But the 1840s weren't all bad for Sam because here comes an opportunity. What? Well, there was a tide of national expansion that would prove fortuitous for Samuel's financial success. You see, in the year 1844, President James Polk was elected to office. And Polk was really big on expanding the United States westward into Texas and into the Western territories. And Colt recognized a promising opportunity and decided to present a sample of his enhanced revolving holster pistols to the U.S. War Department. So once again, here we go. Peddling his guns once again. Now, during the Mexican War in 1846, Captain Samuel H. Walker of the U.S. Mounted Riflemen, an esteemed member of the Texas Rangers, encountered Colt's revolver firsthand, and he was impressed by its effectiveness. And Walker collaborated with Colt to develop an even more improved design. And as a result, General Zachary Taylor ordered 1,000 Colt revolvers in 1847, marking a significant milestone. Now, Colt's manufacturing operations shifted to Hartford, Connecticut, where a man named Elisha K. Root, a skilled supervisor with strong mechanical background, managed a factory. And under Root's guidance, the company, known as Colt Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company, recruited talented mechanics and engineers who further advanced Colt's innovations. And in the early 1850s, the company expanded its presence with a branch established in England. So now we have Colt attracting talented innovators, talented scientists and engineers and improving upon this design. And it's becoming very successful. And it has sales finally. They're finally selling and they're selling overseas as well. Yes, they are. Now, during a visit to Newport, Rhode Island in 1851, Samuel had the pleasure of meeting a young lady. Her name was Elizabeth Hart Jarvis. I remember her from the beginning of this episode. Elizabeth, the eldest of five children, was born into a prosperous and highly respected family in Saybrook, Connecticut. Her father, Reverend William Jarvis, served as an Episcopal minister. And the two, Samuel and Elizabeth, tied the knot in 1856. Now, 1856 was another, there was another reason that 1856 was a remarkable year for Samuel. Tell me. And that's because his company, the Colt Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company, achieved a remarkable feat by producing 150 weapons per day through the use of interchangeable parts, efficient production lines, and meticulously designed precision machinery. Through astute promotion, the Colt brand gained global recognition and became synonymous with quality and reliability. Wow. It reminds me of Henry Ford. Yes, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Colt was a, a masterful marketer. 
and he strategically positioned his firearms within the tapestry of American mythology, even commissioning the renowned artist and explorer George Catlin to create captivating paintings depicting Colt guns in the hands of sportsmen and explorers as they encountered exotic predatory animals in the North and South America. That was smart. So I'm seeing like in my head, like paintings of like men on horseback with their guns showing, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And it's like exciting and, and adventurous and it's almost like cigarettes, like branding. Yes. You know what I mean? Branding this idea, like if you're a real man, you carry a Colt. That's exactly right. Mm Mm-hmm. I actually think that that was Samuel Colt's genius, his his ability to brand himself and to to be a self promoter, for sure. If he were alive today, he would be a major influencer. A hundred percent. He knew how to work people. During the 1850s, the United States experienced growing tensions between the North and South. You don't say. Mm. Which eventually led to the American Civil War. Now. Colt maintained relationships with customers in the South, but when the war officially started in 1861, he shifted his focus to supplying guns to the Union Army, and he equipped the 1st Regiment of Connecticut with rifles and a volunteer regiment from his home state as well. Colt's patent firearms manufacturing company operated at full capacity during the war, employing over 1,000 people at its Hartford factory. And by this time, Samuel Colt had become one of America's wealthiest individuals and owned a magnificent Connecticut mansion known as Armsmere. I don't like the name. You know, I have to say something here because, you know, I, I know a little bit about the American Civil War. You do. You do. And one of the things that I'm impressed with here is the fact that Samuel Colt in his activities and his promotion of this product, of this more efficient, more reliable gun, is one of the reasons that the weaponry was better than the tactics used during the American Civil War. Because up until that time, weapons were kind of shitty. And right. one army would just face off with the other army, right? And shoot mm-hmm. at each other. Mm-hmm. That that was pretty much the tactic, right? Right. Face off. But now that guns are becoming more reliable and quicker, quicker, faster, right? Right. You have the greatest deaths of Americans here in the Civil War than any other any other war in history. This is it. The American Civil War. The greatest number of Americans died in this war versus any other. So that's not lost on me, that he was part of this movement. Now, he wasn't alone. He didn't do it single-handedly. Smith mm-hmm. & Wesson was doing their thing too. But Winchester. Exactly. But this is this is big. This these the, this technology at this time meant that hundreds of thousands died. So right. I just wanted to say that. That's no small thing here. And it's not only that, too. You also, after the Civil War, had the expansion of the West, which we talked about, right? right. But with this expansion of the West, with these sexy cult guns, you know what I mean? It's easier to kill the indigenous people who are living in that area. So he, he kind of precipitated, not precipitated, he made it easier, right? It's now easier to kill. Well, and what's funny about that is that there is reports of indigenous people going back and explaining to their chief, no, they're shooting as many bullets as they have fingers at once. Like, that was the communication. So, like, the bow and arrow was out of there. Like, that wasn't going to work anymore for the indigenous people. They needed to get their hands on some guns if they wanted any kind of leverage in the game. So when I said in the opening that history was changed because of the activities of this man, I don't think that's an overstatement. I agree with you. So anyway... Samuel Colt, the controversial figure who altered the course of weaponry and warfare with his revolver, met his end not at the hands of war, but because of health complications. We all have to die some way. That's true. Colt succumbed to gout 
or gouty arthritis. The most painful thing ever. Yes, it's very painful. And he had complications of rheumatic fever. And this brought about Colt's demise at the relatively young age of 47, just as the Civil War, a conflict which his inventions profoundly affected, raged on. Mm. Now, Samuel and Elizabeth had children, but they did. only one would survive to adulthood. Mm. And that was Caldwell Hart Colt, who was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1856. He would go on to attend Yale University and later in life gained recognition as a prominent yachtsman. So once again, we have this boating theme with mm-hmm. nautical. Samuel. Mm-hmm. Nautical theme for sure. And he was kind of a big deal. In honor of Caldwell Colt, a New York pilot boat was named after him. And he was the proud owner of a yacht named Dauntless and another sloop called the Wizard. So he was a pretty prominent yachtsman. Good names. I agree with those names. Mm -hmm. Also, Caldwell followed in his father's footsteps as a gunmaker, designing a double barrel rifle. Now, there's a sad part to this story. Hmm. So Caldwell, there's mystery surrounding the end of his life. Okay, so he, I mean, it sounds like he really didn't do much. He's pretty young here is what, like there's no well, wife, he, there's no kids. Well, he's, he's just, on his yacht. He's, he's just he's hanging inventing, into He's inventing rifles. And apparently he went out on his yacht at sea and on... January 21st, 1894, he was found dead. He was just found dead? He was just found dead on his boat. He was just boat. found dead on his boat. Yeah. Okay. Just dead. Wow. Yeah. And nobody knows. Nobody knows. A, it's a great mystery. No, no one does know. They assumed it had something to do with his heart, but there wasn't like an autopsy. No one looked into it. Yeah. Wow. Elizabeth was full of sorrow. She erected a parish near Armsmere and dedicated it to her son across from the Church of the Good Shepherd. And she rechristened St. James Episcopal Church as the Church of the Good Shepherd and acquired a timeless Tiffany stained glass window, which still adorns the church today. Yeah. So she erected a church and rechristened another one in honor of her last surviving child who just now died, or the death of her last surviving child. As for Elizabeth, she inherited a controlling interest in the manufacturing company, valued at $3.5 million at the time, which today is over $100 million. She was very active in the company, and so was her brother, who took over as the company president in 1865. And they guided the company through the post Civil War era and into the 20th century. In 1901, Elizabeth sold her interest in Colt's Manufacturing Company, and she passed away in Newport, Rhode Island on August 23rd, 1905, of natural causes. Now, she was a prominent woman in society in Hartford, and upon her death, the Hartford Courant called her the First Lady of Connecticut, a recognition that this newspaper had never before given a woman when they, you know, on her passing. In her will, Elizabeth Colt bequeathed a collection of over a thousand objects, artworks, firearms, and documents to the Wadsworth Athenaeum. She also established a fund for the construction of a Colt memorial that you can see in Colt Park today, I believe. Mm-hmm. And there is a Colt Memorial Wing. The Elizabeth Hart Jarvis Colt Memorial Wing became the first American museum wing to bear the name of a female patron. Aw, well, that was yeah. long overdue. Elizabeth, with her husband and her children, all rest in Hartford's historic Cedar Hill Cemetery. That's where wow. we met her. While the Holt Manufacturing Company continues its operations to this day. Isn't that something? Mm Mm-hmm. And it became renowned for its production of the Colt Single Action Army Handgun, also referred to as the Colt 45 or the Peacemaker. 
serving as the standard service revolver for the U.S. military from 1873 to 1892, this iconic firearm solidified the company's reputation. And since its inception by Samuel Colt, the company has manufactured over 30 million pistols, revolvers, and rifles. I just want to wow. say that the fact that after Samuel died is when the Colt Manufacturing Company got the official go-ahead to be the revolver of the military is not lost on me because that's his dream throughout his entire life, and he couldn't get there uh, mm. until he died, and Elizabeth and Richard did it for him. Just saying. Wow. Okay, so... Thoughts? Jill, conclusions? Well, what are you thinking? I mean, I have a lot of thoughts, um, but it it occurs to me that Samuel Colt's legacy is intertwined with death, both his personal life and that of his family. And I wanted to ask you why you think this is so. Honestly, I was thinking a lot about this. I really don't believe it's just because he manufactured or mass manufactured guns. That's not okay. like I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm saying his intention behind his mission and how he was perpetuating social unrest mm. by... Give me an example of how well, he was proponing social unrest. I'm glad you asked. So, for instance, there was the Crimean War in 1853 to 1856. Samuel went to Eastern Europe and sold guns to the Turks. Then he traveled to the Turks' enemy in Russia or the Russians and said, hey, you know, the... the <laughs> The Turks are um, arming up against you. You guys need to buy my guns too because they're getting the best guns from us. So that was one example. Wow. Wow. It's pretty shitty, right? He really would do anything to to sell a gun. Yeah. This is another thing that kind of really pisses me off, and I'll tell you why. First, okay, let me give me. you the example. So during the American Civil War, where he was sold firearms to both the North and the South in the years leading up to the conflict. But then in 1861, Colt considered establishing an armory in the South and sold 2,000 revolvers to the Confederate forces, right? And so, wow. Yep. And then that was going on until so, someone stopped trade with the South. So he that's was- traitorous. Yes, it's treason. He was supplying arms to the South until wow. the trade stopped during the war. Like the United States said, no more trading with the South, and then it stopped. But to counter the perception that he's a traitorous fuck, he started calling himself Colonel Sam Colt. And it was like this another huge PR stunt to see, be like, I am an American. I am a colonel. And it's just, it's like stolen valor. He's a doctor. He's a colonel. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah, whatever. Exactly. It seems to me like the behavior that he was putting out into the universe created these unforeseen consequences that went out throughout his entire life that was just unfolding as he lived. This law that every success came with this formidable killing of mm. people in his family as he's creating these machines of war. But like you said, it's not just that he created this company that manufactured guns. It's the everything he did, everything he did, he was stealing other people's inventions and selling them off as his own. He was creating social unrest to sell more guns. He was a liar. He didn't care that he was a traitor. Like he would literally do anything to make, make money. money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He exploited the fear of war as, as well as actually perpetuating war by mm -hmm. going to both sides and selling guns. Right. So who do you think is the voiceless then in this story? Because mm. we always ask, lead us to a verifiable story. That let's just give voice to the voiceless. Who wants a voice here? I really believe Elizabeth needs a voice. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Y you need you to why. tell me why, because I don't know that I agree with you, but You don't continue. have to. You don't have All to right. sit with it. Let, sit well, with let's it. sit with it. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I believe... Yes, Elizabeth came from a, a, a prominent family that had prestige and, you know, some wealth. She didn't need, she didn't want the amount of wealth that she got from the cult arms factory. She would rather have had her babies. Mm. Right. So in, it is my opinion 
that if Elizabeth would have known the actual character of this man, because she met him once in 1951, they meet, they didn't get married until 1956, but we don't know how long that courtship was. And she was significantly younger. Like at that time, Sam's pretty much at the end of his life. She didn't have a lot of time to, with him. So the fact that she hooked her wagon to this man and his and his deeds, I don't think she would have done it if she would have known it would be at the cost of all her children. Hmm. Thought, what do you think? I struggle with giving Elizabeth a voice because she benefited from the Colt Manufacturing Company. And she continued to make guns and, you know, because she was the leader of it with her brother. But I do agree with you that she's calling out to us, but for a different reason. Why? Tell me. I think that she's telling us that you have to take into consideration how Sam was raised. She's saying it's not his fault that he was the way he was. I swear to God, I feel like she's making an excuse for him. Like, look at the generational trauma. Look at how his mother died when he was seven. Look at how his family was impacted like that. He was a survivor. He did what he had to do. And did he make bad choices? Yes. But you have to take it with, like, the whole package. Like, he was a survivor ultimately. So I I do feel like she's making excuses for him. I'm sorry. I'm not a fan of Elizabeth. Do you disagree? 150% do I disagree (laughs) with you. All right. Because, and I'll tell you why. I think the I think the exact opposite. The fact that Liz, yes, the fact that Elizabeth was so successful in the in the Colt Firearms Factory after Samuel's death, Mm -hmm. I think is 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 demonstrating that it's not just about manufacturing these guns. It's about the intent behind the guns. And Mm. for Samuel, it was just about getting rich. For Elizabeth, it was carrying on for her husband's name and just to make something successful where he lacked. So Mm. 150%, I think that she's saying, I would have rather had babies and a quiet life as a mother and not been the first lady of Connecticut and married to a man who is ultimately, in my opinion, this is Jill's opinion, a narcissistic bastard. Well, we'll have to agree to disagree because I'm not a fan of Elizabeth. Why? And, uh, what did that, she do to you? She did nothing to you. She I'm was just, just dead there. I just get she was vibes. just laying there. I just get vibes that she's defending Samuel Colt. I, why I do. would Samuel – why would that be a voiceless? Samuel Colt's entire legacy is – is pretending like he was an American genius that invented this stuff. He just, no one thinks. Well, we're like, still only, giving her a voice. I just think what she's saying is different from what you think, what you think she's saying. But I'm saying that there is no perception. There, There is no widely con- conceived perception that he was a bad guy. In American history, he, we look at Samuel Colt as an innovator who innovated and even invented the modern revolver. Mm. So that's the, like, the, that's the zeitgeist of Samuel Colt. That's what, I, that's what I think. Like these books, there's only a small packet of people that ever heard of the hamburgers or the hamburgers. Humburg- yeah. See, you can't even get their name right. Yeah. Well, hamburgers. Poor hamburgers. <laughs> if their name was hamburger, more people would have known of them. <laughs> But do you see what I'm saying? You don't have to agree with me, but like there is no widespread outlook on Sam Colt that has him as a bad guy. I see that. Yeah, like he's like celebrated. So, and she and again, I think she would have rather had her babies. Okay. Can I say one more thing? Well, I mean, I okay. I would think more of Elizabeth if she gave her money to people who like the widows of the soldiers who died agreed in, in the wars. But she I didn't. agree with you. You know what I, I mean? Agree. Like so I don't know. I'm I'm kind of lukewarm. Obviously she called us. You went straight to her monument. Well, she put her money to to support the legacy of her husband's memory. Right? Which again, again goes with what I'm what I'm saying right. that she's like He's not all that bad because I feel like we're judging him and I feel like she's saying she's she's defending him. I don't think she's defending him at all. I think she's defending him. That's how I'm taking it. 
So <laughs> agree to disagree. Okay. Well, I, I right. agree to disagree. Okay. So our hits, while we were driving, we were picking up on that sad situation, the 2012 shooting at Newtown, Connecticut. How do you think that's related here? Gun violence. Gun just violence. Let's m- move on from there. Because okay. it's just really sad. Right. And then in the cemeteries, we were felt like we were surrounded by death. I think that's kind of obvious. I think yeah. with, with the wars and the guns, you, you would have been surrounded by death if you were at war. Well, no, I think it's more like Samuel's life is shrouded oh. in death. Okay. With his right. mother and, we were and his driving, siblings and his children. Got and it. And we were driving through Connecticut when we've noticed cemeteries surrounding us. So it wasn't mm. like we were in the cemetery and like, yes, we're surrounded by dead people. We were just driving in the car and there was like a a – so many cool old cemeteries. There was no way we can possibly stop at all of them. So it just occurred to me, like, we are literally surrounded by death. Right. I I agree with you there. I agree with you there. And then Connecticut feeling bougie. I mean, he probably felt that he was being judged. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And he was. He was absolutely being judged. Mm -hmm. He absolutely was. The war memorial, obviously, that's part of the story and, oh, when I was picking up on someone dying at sea, I think that was Samuel's son for sure. Caldwell for sure. Yeah. For sure. Elizabeth's grave, mm-hmm. mother, sadness, a familiar connection. Mm-hmm. And the churches. The churches. That was significant. Sure. Because tell us why. Because she created the Church of the Good Shepherd in honor of her, her dead son, Caldwell. Exactly. I love that you were picking up on cowboys. I'm I know, thinking the, of the paintings, the paintings yes. with, with the men on horses holding the Colt revolvers. And what do you think it meant that I was feeling that feeling of disappointment and tenacity, just keep going, just keep going? Because that was that was literally Samuel Colt. Like, it didn't matter how many times he fucked up. It didn't matter failed, how, yeah. yeah, it just didn't even matter. He just kept going and going and going and going Agreed. to the point where- Again, the people in Washington, like po- political figures were like, Sam, like, relax, like, stop it. <laughs> like, this is getting embarrassing. All right. Anything else before we tell the people where they can find us? I understand your point of view with Elizabeth. I you see what do. you're saying. I do. I see what you're saying. But I, I feel like both things can be true. I feel Agreed. like she's, she's like, I feel like it was her responsibility. The only sh- thing she had left was Sam's perception moving forward. So she was putting money towards that. But I do think she could have given money yeah. away to like the families that lost their the husbands widows, or sons. Yeah, exactly. Yes. The no, orphans 100%. and widows of the fallen soldiers. Something like that. All right. Why don't you tell the people where to find us? So please check out our website, commonmystics.net. Follow us on our socials at Common Mystics Pod. And please listen in wherever you're listening to your favorite pods. And please consider leaving us a positive review. We love reading and sharing them on our socials. Subscribe, download, like, and share. Share, share, share. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Thank you. Good night. Good night. This has been a Common Mystics Media production. Editing done by Yokai Audio, Kalamazoo, Michigan. 